Well, greetings, welcome. So thankful that you've made a choice to tune in to Marriage God's Way. We are focusing tonight on how to build our marriages in a solid way so that God can bless them and make them a blessing. Uh, my name is Pastor Brian Petrie. My wife Susan and I are over the marriage ministry at the Brooklyn Tabernacle. And whether you're a member of our church, let me just pause there. If you're a member of our church, July 4th, You've already probably heard this, but just in case, we are opening up the doors. July 4th is so, so very excited to be together again. I cannot wait to be with the people of God, to hear people open up their hearts and, and actually hear in a personal way, them praise God, to be able to take in the Word of God together collectively and, and to be able to call on God for what that means. What an amazing day it's going to be. We're going to start in the morning. It may go into the afternoon. Who knows? We may end up camping out for a couple of days. We've been gone for so long. Now, if you're not a member of our church, why don't you jump on a plane? Come, be with us, visit us. And, and celebrate the goodness of God with us. We have so much to celebrate. God has helped us through so many challenges over this past year. I'm sure you can attest to that in a personal way, I can. And in marriage, it has tested us, it has refined us, it has pruned us this, this season that we've been in. And I wanna come out of it differently than I came in. I wanna come out of it more in love with Jesus. I want my marriage to be a greater reflection of his love to my children and to the world that he's put us in. And I hope you're longing for the same. We don't have to settle for what is, and we don't have to, just because we've been stuck in the same routine and the same way of doing life in marriage and we take it for granted for so long, we don't have to stay there. That's why God gives us his word. He gives us his word so we can find hope in a renewed way. And tonight we are gonna have great hope. Dr. Tony Evans, a fantastic, phenomenal teacher of the Word of God, is going to use that gift through all of his experience in marriage to help build us up. And so I hope you're ready to be encouraged. I hope you're ready for a fresh perspective on what God is calling you to in your marriage and how, as you trust him for it, he wants to bless it and make it something that's a blessing to you and make it a blessing to the world that he's put you in. And through all of that, to glorify his name. If you're not with your spouse, maybe put this thing on pause right now. Go find him, wait for him to come home, but why don't you sit together? Take this word in, get out a notepad, make notes that stand out to you about things that maybe you've forgotten or things that maybe are new. But as you, as you take these things in and as you begin to try in a new way to build on that solid foundation, that rock of Christ Jesus, it's gonna help your marriage to stand and it's gonna help it to be something, as I said, it's a blessing to you, a blessing to the world that you're in, and something that'll glorify his name. I'm gonna pray right now that God would help us to receive this word so that we can be encouraged. God, thank you for this evening. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for the gift of marriage. And thank you, God, for what that means to my brothers and sisters. And I know they've been challenged like I have over this past, year and a half, but God, you're with us to help us, to strengthen us, that we might overcome, that we might walk in the victory that Jesus bled out for. So help us right now to take in truth, God. We ask you to make it alive. Give us revelation. Help us to see. Help us to understand that we might grow in your grace, that Jesus be glorified. It's in his precious name we pray. Amen. Watch the video. Be encouraged. Well, hello, Brooklyn Tabernacle family especially the couples. I've been asked by your wonderful pastor and my friend, Pastor Simbola, to speak to his couples as you weather this storm, storms that we've been going through in this pandemic. And I'm always honored whenever I get to uh, minister to the Brooklyn Tabernacle family. I'm just sorry I haven't been able to get to the church because You've been shut down due to uh, COVID-19, but God is still on the throne and you're keeping your church strong. So I am indeed honored. You know, these are tough days for families in general and marriages in particular. All the pressures that are facing, being forced to deal with things that perhaps you've never had to deal with on this level before pandemic on top of pandemic on top of pandemic on top of pandemic and then all the natural things in life that 
that you have to deal with anyway, well, it can be quite a bit. And yet the Bible makes it clear that we are to fight for the family, that we're not to throw in the towel and give up uh, just because things have gotten tough. Unfortunately today, many people, many couples who spend a lot of time and money planning a wedding don't give as much attention to planning a marriage. And yet, if we don't fight for our marriages, we not only jeopardize our personal relationships with our mate, but it affects children and ultimately, as we're seeing today, it affects the whole culture. We live in a day when 50% of the marriages end in divorce, even among Christians. And a large part of the other 50% live together but are not necessarily happy being there. So it can be a challenging situation. I remember uh, reading about one lady who said she thought she had the ideal. It became an ordeal. So now she's looking for a new deal, you know? She, <laughs> this wasn't working out. Another, another man said, uh, weddings, uh, you, you deal with three rings. You deal with uh, uh, the engagement ring, the wedding ring, and the suffer ring, okay? <laughs> because of all the conflicts that can come up in a relationship. And yet, we're called to fight for our marriages. And so, the fact that your church wants to keep strengthening and encouraging and, and uh, uh, promoting marriage uh, is an awesome thing. But shorter and shorter today, couples are calling it quits. It reminds me of the one pastor who was performing the marriage ceremony, and he said, is there anybody here who has a legitimate reason why this marriage should not take place? A voice rang out for, from the crowd, I object, to which the pastor said, be quiet, you're the groom, you can't object. Folks want to quit sooner and sooner and sooner. But God has called you again to fight for that relationship, to not throw in the towel, because marriage, from God's perspective, revolves around one word. And that's what I want to speak to you about today. I want to speak to you about the theological reason to stay in your marriage, fight for your marriage, in spite of the personal challenges you face, the parental challenges you face, the pandemic challenges we all face. We want you to fight and not quit. Malachi chapter 2, verse 14. It gives us this word, this one transformative word, a word that we've kind of lost over the years, that we need to return to. In my book for marriage called Kingdom Marriage, we spend some time talking about this word. The prophet Malachi said, she is your wife by covenant. Let me repeat that. Malachi 2.14, she is your wife, your mate by covenant. He wrote that to folks who are getting ready to get divorced. And he says the reason why you must not get divorced, you must not quit, throw in the marital towel is she is your mate by covenant. That is one of the robust words of the Bible, the word covenant. Let me define it. A covenant is a divinely created relational bond. A covenant is a divinely created relational bond. It's more than a contract. It's legal. Covenants are always legal. They're also relational. And they're always designed to advance God's program in history, which is his kingdom. Whenever God wanted to make an advancement in history, to expand his kingdom program, he would authorize a covenant. And one of the first covenants that he authorized was marriage. It goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, when God said, we're going to create a male and female in our own image, and we want them to fill the earth. That is, multiply 
my image in history. Malachi calls that a covenant. Now, the reason why a covenant is critical is because of the five ingredients that make it up. And so I'm going to be a little bit theological because, you know, we could talk about all the feely good stuff, but that fades. Covenants don't fade. So I want to kind of give you some sticky glue, something that you can hold on to as you battle through whatever the ups and downs are in your relationship and as you covenantalize and kingdomize your relationship with your mate. There are five ingredients to a covenant. All covenants have these five ingredients. Let me talk about each one, summarize it, try to apply it to where we are today so that you can come out of your marriage stronger than ever, not because of your emotions, but because of your covenant. The first thing you need to know about any covenant, and in this case, the marriage covenant, is that it is, the theological word is transcendent. That simply means God rules over it. God is in charge of it. The first marriage in the Bible, God was the matchmaker. He made the man. He made the woman from the man. He went and got the woman and brought the woman to the man. And the first nuptials were overseen by God. Because God never intended marriage to only be two. He always wanted marriage to be three. The man, the woman, and himself. He wanted to be all up in the relationship. It's transcendent means God rules. That, that's why God says, let not man put asunder what God has joined together. Have you ever noticed? Folks want to get married in the church, but they want to get divorced in the courtroom. In other words, they'll go to God to get it started, but go to man to break it up. That's because God gets lost in the process. God says, I want to make the final decisions regarding your relationship. You know when all hell broke loose in the first marriage? It's when Satan entered the picture in the homestead. He came into the garden. That was Adam and Eve's homestead, the place of abode. And he left God ruling their relationship out of the conversation. He said, hath God said... He didn't say half the Lord God said. Up until that point, after God had created man, it was the Lord God. The Lord meaning God is going to call the shots. He says, I don't mind religion, Satan said, but let's leave God calling the shots, Lord. Let's leave that out of the equation. You do not need a relationship. Just stick with religion. That's why you can go to church and still have a bad marriage. That's religion. That's not predicated on the Lord overseeing the relationship. So the first thing, if you're going to fight through all of the struggles that you have in marriage, is to make the decision God can overrule either of us or both of us in this relationship. Because if God can overrule it, you're going to let a man or another woman overrule it, even if that man and woman is you. <laughs> so... God does not want to be overruled. He wants to be transcendent. He wants to overarch it. He wants to be able to speak into it so that his decisions become the final decisions in the relationship. One of the reasons that many marriages don't make it is because God loses his say-so. Remember when you got married, at least most people, do you promise to do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this? And then you throw in that little tagline, so help me God. <laughs> what you are making is a transcendent statement that God gets to make the final say-so in the relationship. So the first thing you need to know is that God wants to rule over your marriage. He doesn't want to be left standing in the altar while you go on the honeymoon, okay? He wants to be all up in it, all right? Because he wants to be umbrellaing over it. The second aspect of a covenant is, the formal word is hierarchy. That means a chain of command or an ordering of function. 1 Corinthians 11.3 says, God is over Christ, 
Christ is over every man. A man is over a woman. He talks about a hierarchy, not a hierarchy of being, not a hierarchy of significance. It's a hierarchy of function. Jesus is God. All the attributes of deity dwell in him, Hebrews 1 says. That is his equality of being, equality of essence. He is all that the Father is in terms of his nature, his divine being. But when it came to executing heaven's program in history, advancing God's kingdom in time and space, he acquiesced to the Father. So what did Jesus say? He said, I've come to do my father's will, even though I'm equal to the father, because now to carry out his agenda in history, he had to be willing to submit to divine legitimate authority. Well, what Jesus did to his father, he expects every man to do to him. Now I know men like to talk about submission but usually they're talking about uh, a woman submitting to them, while unfortunately we submit to nobody. Doesn't work like that. Jesus is over every man. That's why the Bible even tells a woman that her submission is to the Lord because it trumps her husband. Because her commitment to Christ must overrule her commitment even to her mate. One of the big problems today is we have men demanding submission that they're not willing to model themselves. They're not willing to show what it looks like when we yield to God's rule over our lives. And when we fail to do that, what we wind up seeing in our home is our absenteeism of functioning under God is reflected in the absenteeism of our mates functioning under us. And so what we do is wind up getting what we ourselves give to the Lord. Christ is over every man. That is why God created Adam before he created Eve. He created Adam before he created Eve because Adam had to submit to God. He said, from every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. From every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. But the tree in the midst, you shall not eat it lest you die. He didn't tell that to Adam and Eve. Eve hadn't even been created yet. He told that to Adam because Adam would be responsible. Uh, whenever you read the Bible about the fall of man, not about Eve, God came looking into God and said, Adam, where are you? The Bible says in Romans chapter five, uh, in Adam all die, not in Adam and Eve. Why? Because the man would be held responsible, first and foremost, to his submission, surrender to Almighty God. God has a chain of command that everybody's obligated to function under without losing their equality of being. Jesus doesn't denigrate the man. The man is not to denigrate the woman. He is to model the submission that God asks the woman to give to him. And so as he models it, she models what he's modeling because everybody, including Jesus, is submitting to somebody. So now the wife comes under the legitimate, not illegitimate, authority of her husband because God operates by a hierarchy. In fact, throughout the Bible, God condemns when things get flipped. He says, for example, in Isaiah chapter three, because the men had failed, he says, your children are in rebellion and your women rule over you because the men had failed in their responsibility. We're seeing cultural collapse today. One of the reasons why we have all these pandemics socially is because far too many men are missing in action. They're like the abominable snowman. Footprints everywhere, we just can't find them. Either because they're not physically there or they are there, but they have abandoned their divinely ordained role. God holds the man responsible. He created the woman to walk beside as his wife, that man to fulfill kingdom business. If, the, if your husband is 
fulfilling his kingdom responsibility, then you are obligated to follow that lead because he's following the Lord. As long as you remember, your ultimate obligation is to the Lord. Now, what happens when we lose the hierarchy? When you get out of order, you lose God's involvement in the relationship. Let me say it again. Whenever you are out of order, the man is out of order with Christ, the woman is out of order with her husband, when, when that order starts to flip, chaos becomes the result. Um, my garage I had a little problem, and that is the door would not open. I was trying to figure out why wouldn't the door open. I'm pushing all the right buttons, but the door wouldn't open. Uh, it was plugged in, but the door wouldn't open. Couldn't get my car out. So I finally called the garage repair guy and said, I can't get out. It won't open. It's too heavy for me to lift. My garage won't open. Well, he said, before I come all the way over there, go to the door. So took my cell phone, went to the door. He said, you see those two canisters at the bottom? I said, yes. He says, which way are they pointing? I said, well, one is pointed toward the other one, and the other one is pointed straight forward. He says, that's your problem. I said, what? He says, they're out of alignment. They need to be facing each other, so they're not getting the message. He says, until they get an alignment, you won't be able to open the door. And with a little turn, I pushed the button and miracle of all miracles, my garage door opened. You see, when you're out of alignment, things don't open. Life gets heavy because we're operating out of sync with God's plan and will for marriage. So it is absolutely critical that everybody is in alignment with God, with one another, so that God can flow to and flow through the relationship. In fact, this order allows you to be legitimately unified. Remember, Jesus said, me and my father, we are one. We hanging out on the same page. That speaks of unity. When every, anybody gets out of order, unity is disturbed. When unity is disturbed, God's blessing is lost. 1 Peter 3, 7 says, when husbands and wives are in conflict, tell the husband, don't pray, God won't listen. Yep, God will ignore your prayers when things are out of alignment. And that's why what? Satan wants to keep us fussing, fighting, and cussing. Because he wants to keep things out of alignment so that even if we go to church and even if we pray, God doesn't pay attention. But that's why 1 Corinthians 7, 5 says, if you're in alignment and you're in agreement, you can get God's attention. And don't we need that to heal hurts in our heart, to heal hurts with our children who may be rebellious, to heal uh, wounds in our marriage, to help with a financial situation or a job decision. That unity thing, because you're operating in sync with God's order, is absolutely critical. The third thing of a covenant are the rules. Covenants have rules. Now, we could talk about the rules in uh, a lot of detail, but uh, let me boil it down to two words. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33. It says, husbands, love your wives. Wives, see to it that you respect your husband. So we can take everything that the Bible says about marriage, and it boils down to two words, love and respect. A woman needs her heart massaged, love. A man needs his head massaged, respect. And when you massage a woman's heart, and she massages your head, you got a thing going on. What is love? Well, let me give you a biblical definition. Love is the decision. It's not the feeling. It's the decision to compassionately, righteously, and responsibly seek the well-being of another. I felt that when I said it. Let me say it again. Love is the decision to compassionately, to righteously, it has a standard, to responsibly seek the well-being of another. So, to love your wife means she always knows you're looking after her best interest. And a woman in most cases will acquiesce to a husband even if she doesn't fully agree when she knows he's thinking about her best in the final decision 
that is being made for the family because she knows she has not been left out of the equation. That's what it means to love. You show your love in your service. Um, since the man is responsible and you are the head of the house, because we like to say that, don't we? We like to be king of the castle, okay? The Bible says the greatest of you shall be your servant. So why don't you do a little, little uh, test? Take a sheet of paper, draw a line down the middle, put everything you do for her on one side, everything she does for you on the other side, and if her list is longer than your list, then that means she's being more like the man and you being more like the woman because the greatest shall be your servant. You have the greater role. You have the greater responsibility. You should be the bigger servant. All right? So I know, let me get off of that. I don't want to get into trouble with the men. But the woman has a role too. She has a rule. Respect. See to it, he says, that you respect your husband. That's massaging his, I know, we call it ego. That's massaging his head. That, that's making him feel kingish. That's giving him high honor. What does 1 Peter 3, 6 says? It says, like Sarah, who called Abraham Lord. Mm. You should look at your husband right now and call him Lord. You know, just let him see what it feels like for you to call him Lord. All right. That was a statement of honor. He should hear your honor. He should hear you honor him in front of your children, in front of other people. He should, you should feed his head. Did you know that there's no command in the Bible for a wife to love her husband? Not a one. Now, there's a statement in Titus 2, teach young women, uh, older women teach younger women how to love their husband, but that's an indicative. It's not a command. It's not an imperative. There's no command to love her husband because the way a husband feels love is when he feels respected. He know he's loved when he's respected. Like Sarah who called Abraham Lord. And guess what Sarah got for doing that? She got a miracle. I mean, she got a baby at 90 years old. Now, I know you're not trying to get pregnant right now, but that's not the point. The point is the supernatural intervention of God into her circumstance. If you illegitimately, illegitimately dishonor your husband, you're blocking God from answering your prayers. Right now, the two of you need to come together in whatever you're facing as a couple, particularly with all this stuff going around, it's racial, it's cultural, it's social, it's, it's dangerous, it's financial, it's, it's just crazy. Well, you need, to be, you need to be together. You need to be on the same page. Then come the sanctions. That's number four. What's the sanction? Sanction are the blessings and the cursings. In other words, the benefits and the loss of benefits that come when you're operating in God's covenant. It's the benefits. In the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, he gave them the blessings and the cursing. If you do this, you'll be blessed. If you don't do this, you'll be cursed. It's the same principle throughout the Bible that God favors us when we're covenantally operating and orderly operating with his kingdom program, advancing his name. You want the benefits of that. You know, um, when you buy something, you, you get a warranty. If it's new, they warranty it, right? That means they're going to look out for its functioning properly based on the nature of the warranty. In other words, the manufacturer is going to cover you as long as you have that warranty. But I can guarantee you there's always a caution with a warranty. And that is that you're not doing anything outside of what the product was designed to do. In other words, you can't take a hammer and start banging, banging on the motor talking about come fix it because you're not handling it for the purpose for which it was established. Well, God warranties marriage. He wants it to last a lifetime, but he only warrants it when it is functioning in the way that he has designed it to function, which is covenant. So he says, I'll come and bless it. I'll favor it. I'll walk with you through the trials, the difficulties, the prayer needs. I will be with you when you're in my covenant. But if you're not, the warranty's not in, in, in play because you're on your own because you're operating 
outside of my rules. Finally, all covenants have continuity, or another word would be inheritances. God would always offer long-term repercussions generationally when people operated covenantally. And isn't that what we need today? We need to be able to pass on something to the next generation, our children and our grandchildren, because God thinks in threes, says a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children, okay? That's three generations. We're having generational chaos. And that's because far too many of our young people are not coming out of governmental environments where the mother and father were operating in a marriage that reflected the values of the kingdom of God. And so what you want to do is you want to think long term. Let me explain something. This is not first and foremost about your happiness. God's first goal for you is not for you to have a happy marriage. I know that doesn't sound right because everybody wants to be happy ever after, right? That's not God's program. That's a benefit, not a purpose. Remember what he said when he created? He said, we're going to make man in our own image, male and female, we're going to make them, and they're going to rule. And then it says, and then he blessed them. He didn't bless them on the front end. He blessed them after he told them what he expected from them. Then the blessing came. Far too many couples want to be blessed who don't want to function under the five elements of God's covenant and therefore wonder why the marriage is not going well. We're miserable. We're fighting all the time. We want to get a divorce. Well, when you leave the covenant, you're out there on your own and you do the best you can. Now, probably listening to me today are marriages on a number of different levels. Some are ecstatic. You just hate to be away from each other. You're so in love. Others are mediocre. It's okay. Nothing to get that excited about, but it's not like terrible. And others, you wonder why you're still there. You're looking for the first opportunity. You, you're hoping that you can find a biblical reason for divorce. In fact, some of you want to make up one because just you want out. There, there are all kinds of levels. Well, I have good news for you. Remember Jesus' first miracle, John chapter 2? turning water into wine. Wine in the Bible positively is used of joy. So the joy juice was gone, okay? <laughs> because there was no more wine. Jesus' mother said, hey, this is the time to show him you Messiah. He said, my time for public exposure is not here yet, but we're gonna help out this wedding. And he commanded them to fill these barrels with water to the top. Whatever he says to you to do, Mary said, you do that. They filled it up, and as they were coming back, a transformation occurred, and water became wine. The head waiter went to the bridegroom, and he was confused. He said, now, how we roll up in here, the way we do weddings, is you put the good wine first, and you leave the bad wine for last because they've drunk so much of the good wine, they don't know how bad the bad wine is. But what you have done is you've saved the best for last. You know what Jesus wants to do in your relationship? Save the best for last. So no matter how bad it's been, how much challenge you're going through now, the best is yet to come because he still knows how to turn water into wine. He still knows how to bring the joy back, the peace back, the pleasure back, the excitement back. He knows how to do it. And the thing about it is he turned it on a dime. So why don't you right now go before the Lord as a couple and say, Lord, take us to the next level from wherever we are, whatever level we're at, take us higher. Turn this water into wine. Because when he does, you'll be reminded at a whole nother level about how glorious how powerful, how loving your Savior is. So don't let this pandemic dissuade you or overly disturb you. Come together in unity as a covenantal couple and watch what God can do. 
Well, that was outstanding. Dr. Evans is such a gifted teacher. I'm so thankful for how he's opened up his life and uh, he's taken time to impart truth and his experience into your marriage and mine. He didn't have to do it. He could have declined this invitation that we gave him, but he loves our church and he loves marriage. And uh, he, he has given us a gift tonight. And I hope that the gratitude you have for that gift goes beyond just, you know, amen. I, I hope you see this as God's way of trying to stir you and your marriage as he's trying to stir me and mine to begin to trust him like never before, to do it his way. Marriage, God's way, always brings about life. It always brings about blessing. It always helps us to know love in ways we would never know it apart from that. So I want to encourage you. If you took notes, go back and look at those notes. If you didn't take notes, I would encourage you to go take notes because so many good things were said, you'll never remember them all just by a sitting. But write them out and take over the next several weeks. Take one principle a week. Do your own study. Uh, husbands and wives, just look at different scriptures and different verses that may relate to that principle and, and then begin to sit and talk about it and begin to say, you know what, let's be intentional about doing this God's way. Let's be intentional about applying the principle to our lives. Principles don't necessarily have life. They, they don't change people. Faith in truth changes things. Those principles are just truths from God's heart to ours. They're his way of showing us this way will bring about his blessing. And when we trust him for it, boy, that's where life comes and that's where things change. And if you need change in your marriage, and we all do, we all do. This world that we live in, the circumstances that we face, it's always draining us. It's always taking uh, withdrawals from the accounts of our life. But when we take the time to make these kind of deposits, uh, we talk about them, we pray about them, we invite him into the middle of it, that's where uh, a deposit's left that begins to allow those rivers of living water that Jesus promised to fill us, to flood us, and to begin to flood out of us into our marriage, into our family, into the world that God's called us to. So I want to take a moment and pray for you. And pray, maybe you tuned in and you are struggling right now in your marriage and you're wondering, is there any hope? There's always hope. There's always hope. God's word is the only thing that can be trusted. When you trust in it, he is obligated to be faithful and he wants to be faithful to you. He's not like begrudgingly giving out uh, his faithfulness. He longs to pour it out into your life. He just needs to find a receptive heart, so, somebody that would open it. That's what faith is. It's opening our heart to God. Would you open your heart tonight? Uh, for whatever God may have spoken to you in this moment and whatever he's gonna to continue to speak to you as you take over the next several weeks time to reflect on what was said and begin to trust him for those things. He will be faithful. And I wanna pray that he does that right now. Father, thank you for my brothers and sisters. And Lord, no matter what brings them into this meeting tonight, no matter how they might be feeling about their marriage, whatever they might have gone through, whatever may have happened, nothing is greater than you. You can help us with whatever we're facing, you're God. There's nothing greater than you. So we trust you. We trust you for these principles that we've learned tonight. God, help us to be students of your word. Help us to dig into God's word, even as our brother, Dr. Evans, has done for himself. Help us to do that for ourselves. Not that we could just teach people things, but that we would hold on to it, that we would know life because of it. And where we know that life, God, there is blessing. And where that blessing flows freely, there is love, there is joy, there's peace. And these are the things that we need in the middle of our marriage. So help my brothers and sisters, help me to do this more effectively, better with each day, trusting you for the things that you say. We want to do marriage your way, God, not ours. Ours robs us of life. It, it comes with withdrawals from the accounts of our relationship. But when we do it your way, we deposit and there is a surplus, there is an overflow. So help us to do that, that not only would we be blessed, but that our marriages would be a blessing in turn, but ultimately that Jesus, you would be glorified. That's what we, that's what we live for in our marriage, to see you glorified. So glorify your name as we trust you for these things. In Jesus' precious name we ask. Well, listen, I hope this was an encouragement to you. I hope that you go back and you do what we said. You review these things that were taught to us. But if you need some help, sometimes when you're in the middle of conflict and you've been doing it for weeks or months and sometimes even years, you lose perspective. You just dig into your positions and it becomes a standoff. And in that, you might need some help. We want to help you. 
Uh, if you'll reach out to us, if you'll give us a call, we will respond. If you catch us when we're in church, July 4th, come on out. We're going to be together July 4th. Come out, catch us, talk with us. We will sit, take our time to give you some perspective that'll help you to better trust Jesus for your marriage. But we love you. We're praying for you. Can't wait to see you. God bless you.